Pulse 95 Live. Pulse 95 Live. At Expo Center Charger. Yes, we are continuing our discussions with world class photographers. Joined with me here, my well seasoned co guest, uh, co host guest. Co guest. We're both guests. <laughs> we are. We are too. We are. It's a wonderful event. Mike Brown, uh, welcome back to the hour. Welcome back, Mikey. Yes. And once again, we're here with yet another amazing photographer. We'd like to welcome Omar Havana. Hi, everyone. So for formality, Omar Havana is a Spanish freelance photojournalist whose full-time job has been to cover stories from across the world. Omar's uh, uh, photographs have been published in many international media outlets, the likes of Nat Geo, New York Times, and many more. Knowing that photographs were the best way to show the world the current issues of today, Omar has also focused and continues to focus on collaborating with humanitarian organizations across the world. Nice to have you here, Amar. Nice to be here. So I wanted to ask you, uh, because you recently had a focus group uh, just the other day titled Marketing and Photojournalism. But the way you were teaching this focus group, um, because you're someone who is self-taught, you've spent uh, all your life, you've never went into like any kind of like professional photography studies of any kind. You just picked it up along the way. and. I just wanted to ask you, like, how was it? How is how is it trying to be self-taught? Well, it's difficult, but at the same time, it's beautiful because it's just the only thing that you have to do is just uh, be aware that you can learn something from from absolutely everyone, not just photographers. I mean, actually, we, as a photojournalist, I think we learn more from the people that we cover the stories. No, so it's, it's the same people that we are doing their stories who are teaching you little by little, little by little, and they are these, the people that make me a photojournalist. So yeah. as a photojournalist, I think my, I'm getting older now, so I think it's now my time to actually pass everything that I learned from other people to, to young, passionate photographers that they are a little bit lost in this massive industry, which is not easy. Mm. Something I noticed with uh, almost all the photojournalists here at Exposure is the incredible giving nature of you guys. You know, we were just talking to Yana and, you know, it's all coming out of the heart. Now, what you listeners don't know is I was sitting outside a little restaurant in the street last night with this man and we're just talking until gone midnight and the stories are incredible. And, you know, the size of these guys' heart, this man has a huge heart. He tries to hide it, <laughs> but he does, you know, and I mean... Your exhibition, which you, I'm going to go straight in, if that's okay with Get you. Get right into it. You know, your exhibition, there's a really powerful personal story behind that one as well. You're living in Nepal. Yes. And it's just before your wedding day. Yes. And an earthquake strike. Yes. Uh, what was it like waking up that morning? It was a very strange situation, to be honest with you. It was a normal Saturday sleeping until late you know we were out with friends and you know, typical Saturday you don't have nothing to do and all of a sudden the whole house was moving around I thought my wife was like waking up man we have to have lunch <laughs> and it was actually an earthquake which to be honest I didn't realize what it was I just ran out of, of my sixth floor in, in a big building in Kathmandu and when we hit the street and we see the faces of the people it's when we realized that actually you know it was it was something we didn't know it was an earthquake it was what a slide, whatever. But uh, yeah, as soon as you hit, it's all of a sudden you don't, yeah, a few minutes of, of fear and automatically your reaction is like, a, well, I have to help these people doing the only thing that I know how to do, which is taking photos. So come back to the building, grab the camera, and my personal story starts. Uh, at the end of the day, I was living there. Nepal is home. It's still home. And my compromise with the Nepali people uh, is, is limited you know, is they give me absolutely everything from the same day that I arrived to the country the minimum thing that I could do is try to help doing the only thing that I do which is telling the world what it was happening one thing I noticed about uh, your photo gallery it's it's titled endurance and when you step in there is there's all this depiction of destruction pain tragedy but I get a sense of hope when I see the images as well that that not all is bad. There is there is this wonderful picture I saw of the child with the school bag, just walking in the in the debris, and it's just like, despite all that's happened, life goes on, you know. 
That's actually my favorite photo, and this is the day that everything reshaped around me. It was the day that the kids come back to school, 31st of May, the earthquake happens on April 25. Uh, the photo is taken on a square where 37 people died, with all the, all, the, all the buildings were destroyed, and where I spent so many hours, so many days, uh, documenting the life of the people rebuilding the square. Uh, I took the photo, I don't like to take photos of the faces of the kids when I don't know the kids, so I took the photo because I wanted to show the path to the school, the path to the education, and run after that uh, just to see his face. And I saw the most beautiful smile that I could see. It was kind of, yeah, as you say, the hope. Yeah. The rebuilding starts. And the rebuilding starts for a thing that the father told me a few, few days before uh, in the same square, it was a building completely collapsed and it was a hole no more than 50 centimeters square and the father was getting in the building and getting out the building getting in getting out getting in and the only thing that he was taking out of that house was books and i was at a certain point i ran to him and i said man come on you're gonna die the, the building is gonna collapse on you he told me man you don't understand anything you are only half nepali you are not full nepali you don't understand so you we don't gonna rebuild the country with bricks we're gonna rebuild the country with books and I don't have the money to buy new books to my daughter. So oh, I wow. need to get in, save the books, because this is the future of Nepal. That's Nepali people. Nepali people is hope. It's a country full of hope. It's a country full of resilience. It's a country full of endurance. And this project is a personal search to try to understand and to try to be like them, which is impossible. I'm no Nepali. Uh, a lot of your work uh, is a series of uh, stories um, that cover tragedy in some sort of way. Um, so I wanted to ask you, how, how do you find that balance to, because you, you want to, it's not like you want to market tragedy, but you want to do it so that you can make something compelling, so that you can raise awareness. And, and what is it that you see from other medias or other photo journalists that they do wrong when they, when they try to capture tragic, you know, tragedy, tragic events? I don't think it's wrong or right. Mm. in photojournalism or you know, in media. It's true that the society is demanding pain, is demanding war, is demanding all that. All of a sudden, you know, one week after the attention flips to other story and this the attention suddenly disappear. Uh, I just think photojournalism has to come in from the heart. It's, uh, it's also it's explaining who you are as a person. Mm. So I don't think my colleagues or my media is doing wrong. It's, it's, it's just an extension of who you are. What are your thoughts? You just said, you know, people demand pain and war and, and it is it's kind of like the car crash mentality we don't often see people slow down on the street to look at the beautiful view but there's a car crash and there's a, then a tailback because they want to look at the destruction so as a photojournalist you're covering some harrowing things and sure in these circumstances we see the very best of humanity as well as the very worst but in the earthquake it's probably the very best because everybody is looking after everyone else do you ever long to cover maybe a more positive and uplifting story? I mean, you've got one here, yeah, in Nepal. Okay, there's destruction, it is positive, it is uplifting. But you know, I don't know, something, you know what I mean, that at first glance makes you kind of go, oh, wow. I did it, I did it. I try actually to cover positive stories. The only thing, of course, as photojournalists, we also have to make a living, and I'm sorry, positive stories are no, are no, are no sold. What are your so thoughts on that? How does that feel for you as a, as a storyteller, like maybe you're longing to go, look at this incredible, great story. Look, these kids have been saved and da da da, and they're now living in this great house with flowers in the garden. Nobody wants to look at those pictures because they're looking at the car crash. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit discouraging, to be honest with you. It's like when you do the story, you feel like you have the story of your life. I mean, I take every story like that. Every time that I do a story, it's always the best story that I did in my life. When you try to tell the story and you see that the world is not interesting about positive stories, it's interesting about football, it's interesting about famous people, it's interesting about many things. But when it's coming to the news, it's coming, it's, it's just, the world likes to read about tragedies. I don't know why, I don't know. I really, I try to understand why, no. I feel this but at the same time, you know, it's a, like a very stubborn person. And I, I, I keep working in positive stories because I think actually you need a balance. You need to open a newspaper and you need to read four tragedies, but it should be four beautiful stories because the, bad is, the world is not such a bad place. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I would say to everybody coming to Exposure, when you look at... It's really easy to walk past the, your exhibition and see, you know, some destruction, but come and take a closer look, world. Don't do the Instagram next, next, next thing. Because when you look into the eyes of the people in this exhibition of yours, 
this is a positive story. This is about humans helping humans in the most terrible situation. One of the images is of the building you lived in, just a pile of rubble. Yep. You got out just in time. Yep. Uh, Amar Havana, thank you so much for being here. Um, to all this next, to all the other stories that you will cover from across the world, we wish you all the best. To those who are visiting the sixth edition of Exposure, I recommend you check Amar Havana's photo gallery. It is titled Endurance, and there's just a lot of emotions right when you step in to the exhibition. Let's take a bit of a break and let's wrap it up here uh, on the hour, just to give you a little bit of details on what you can expect from the sixth edition of Exposure right here, only on Pulse 95.